Welcome to the uh, 32nd in our series on Middle Eastern and North African Islamic history. And today we're going to finish what we were talking about last time, which is the Tanzimat Ottomanism and the uh, Turkish War of 1877 to 1878. For those who are familiar, uh, permit me uh, to explain the rules. Uh, this is not an academic presentation. I am not accredited in uh, history, religion, um, politics, or well, uh, or any of the subjects that we're going to be discussing today. I'm a lawyer by training, um, and I'm just a lay person who enjoys this and is trying to give this from a secular perspective, right? We're going to touch upon some religious topics. Um, in each case, I'm trying to address it from that secular historical perspective. Uh, let's uh, be respectful of the uh, you know, of the subject matter. But that said, I love interactivity. Questions, comments, clarifications are always welcome. Um, please put them in the chat. I do read the chat and I will respond in time. Um, as I always say, classes are a 101 and a 201, meaning if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if you already knew something, I'll probably teach you something you didn't know. Um, when I give dates for people, those are the years of service. Uh, that's not their, age, not their birth and death, although it can be their death uh, in certain cases. Um, I like to do what's called a two hour hard stop, which means that if we get to that two hour mark and um, I've already, uh, and there's still more slides, which is probably gonna happen tonight. Uh, that's okay, that's where we'll stop and we'll uh, let some of that uh, roll over into next week. And finally, this is a recording like the other 31 episodes and you can watch it later um, accordingly. All right, there is no quiz today, given how much we have to do. So, part one, uh, finishing Tanzimat, Ottomanism, and the Russo-Turkish Wars. So, we've been going through this situation where we've been, where we've looked at the 1800s in the Ottoman Empire following three distinct tracks. The first track we followed was the Balkan uh, revolutions. Uh, the next uh, we followed was uh, Napoleon Muhammad Ali Pasha, and that took us two weeks. Um, and now we were finishing the Tanzimat Ottomanism and the Russo-Turkish War. And similar to the Two Towers, these are three tracks that are sort of in the same time period in the same empire. And of course, there's necessarily interplay between all of them. But it's really important uh, to sort of see them individually to sort of follow the progress and understand what's going on. So we had discussed how Mahmoud II really started building the apparatus for a modern army, which he called the Asakir Mansure Mohammedia, the victorious army of Muhammad. And he used Western training in uh, chemistry and in warfare, translating tactical manuals in order to build universities and colleges that could teach this kind of war. We also talked about how the Janissaries as a political class were eliminated um, in the auspicious incident in 1826. Um, and we talked about how the process of conscription began in the Ottoman Empire with the first census being taken in nearly 300 years. The last previous census was in 1526. Um, and that census was almost exclusively in Turkey indicated with uh, blue squares or in the European provinces indicated with orange squares um, of the Ottoman Empire. This, the census really couldn't penetrate much beyond Anatolia. And one of the other things that comes out of the census other than conscription is that it leads to the abolition of the tax farms, which of course uh, alienates the Sultanate from a number of the ions and notables in the uh, Middle Eastern parts of the empire. We then talked about the creation of Tanzimat or this um, reorganization, reordering um, led by Mustafa Rashid Pasha. Um, and it begins with the Hadith Sharif uh, Gulhane, uh, the, um, the Edict of the Rose Colored Chamber in 1839, which sets up a number of different aspects that will be changing in the way that the Ottoman governs uh, Ottoman Empire governs things. We're talking about a reorganization of taxes and uh, a standardization of the military, um, equality for all Ottomans, regardless of religion, public trials, rule of law, um, uh, security uh, for all the people throughout the state, 
and a central bureaucracy. Uh, all of these are things that existed in uh, Western Europe, of course, and uh, in other and, and other parts of Europe to varying degrees. But the Ottoman Empire was really focusing on emulating the liberal countries of Western Europe, uh, namely France and Britain. All right, when I say liberal, I'm talking about people who wanted governments based on written constitutions that uh, empowered the bourgeoisie, uh, established constitutional republics, um, and saw the secular overpowering the religion, a religious aspect of life. Um, and the government was uh, designed to protect private citizens um, as opposed to conservatives who genuinely wanted to preserve the older institutions, holding that these institutions had provided peace for longer periods of time and liberal policies were necessarily unstable uh, because they didn't go with an established bureaucracy or established uh, monarchies. Ottomanism was this idea that uh, every citizen within the Ottoman Empire, uh, every subject to the Sultan would actually be part of a new Ottoman fabric. Um, and it was based on symbols of Ottoman history, certainly, but those systems would be, uh, despite the fact that they may be Muslim in nature, would apply to all the citizens of the empire, including Christians and Jews. And it would be a relative flattening of the um, social distinctions that had previously existed uh, for the different religious minorities. Many of these religious minorities um, were, uh, many of these minorities uh, saw it positively in that they would be further integrated and be able to have opportunities that they'd previously not had. And in other cases, they were uh, angry that the specific privileges and benefits that they had managed to achieve as, as minority groups um, would be removed from them. For example, they would now have to testify in Muslim-dominated courts. The courts were now split uh, in terms of their judges, but um, it meant that Jews would not be adjudicated by Jewish law, Christians would not be adjudicated by Christian law, um, all would be adjudicated by Ottoman law. And there was a sense that uh, citizens should be loyal uh, to the Ottoman Empire as opposed to loyal to um, their particular uh, region or religious group and following this large scale bureaucracy towards a new tomorrow. This idea of Ottomanism, this idea of Ottoman identity um, was really the dominant center um, of, yeah, of politics. All right. And we talked about how leading up to the Crimean War, uh, Mustafa Rashid uh, achieved the diplomatic coup of bringing the British and the French onto the Ottoman side. Um, and the Ottomans were able to inflict a massive defeat on Russia, um, although the Ottomans had very little to do with that victory, right? The victory was mostly at the hands of the French and the British. The Ottoman forces, while there were some moments of strength, like, his, like in the Siege of Silistra, um, by and large, uh, it was the British and French forces that besieged Sevastopol and won the war. In fact, the Turkish fleet had been destroyed by the Russians at the Battle of Sinop. And in order to secure the Turkish Black Sea fleet, the Russians were forbidden from building a new uh, Black Sea fleet and had to be demilitarized on, from a naval perspective. We also saw the Treaty of Paris, which resulted in the Ottoman Empire joining the Constitution of Nations and the equality of Christians being recognized to the extent where uh, the provisions of the Treaty of Kucho Kainarzo, which allowed European interference with Ottoman affairs um, with regards to the Christian minorities who were unequally treated, um, sort of becoming abrogated. Now, one of the important things that uh, we also notice is that the Ottoman Empire um, really has a difficult post-mortem after Crimea. Uh, you have the situation where the one third of the Ottoman military that participated in the Crimean War did not return, whether they died of malnutrition, uh, deaths on the battlefield, um, and other issues. Um, this was a very high uh, rate. And even the Egyptian troops that were sent by um, the Wali at the time, uh, uh, Abbas Hilmi, um, were superior to the Ottoman forces. And so it made it very clear that um, the Ottomans had a lot of catching up to do still, even though they'd been moving at a breathtaking pace. And of course, as I pointed out, the Europeans um, uh, forced the Ottoman Empire to declare 
uh, the true equality of all Ottoman citizens before the law, and that all Ottoman citizens would become eligible, uh, sorry, all male Ottoman citizens would be eligible for conscription, and, um, which was something that most uh, of the minorities that have previously been uh, subject to unequal laws were less than happy about. So where we left off was here, right? We left off at this point where we were talking about the young Ottomans. And the young Ottomans um, were generally in favor of the Tanzimat reforms to the extent that they were promoting this Ottoman identity, promoting this uh, sense of liberal orientation as opposed to conservative orientation. They were on board with this larger project. Where they were not on board with was the organization of that project. So um, this is a debate if you've been uh, following our European Union um, discussions, um, or if you're following American politics, you'll recognize this debate almost immediately. Um, when the leaders of Tanzimat, uh, Mustafa Rashid Pasha, Emin Ali Pasha, uh, Fuad Pasha, were organizing the principles and legislation that this was an entirely top-down operation. This was a situation where um, they would, and where these leaders would dictate what the principles were that they wanted to espouse, how the law would achieve that, and then that's what they would do. And um, Namik Kemal and Ibrahim Shinasi, um, uh, among other uh, individuals, but these are probably the two most famous, um, decide, uh, wrote back saying, no, that the Tanzimat reforms should not be a top-down process. It should be one that is democratically engaged with uh, by the local population. Um, we don't need the government telling us what to do. We can be part of that process. We, we should have a parliament or some sort of democratic institution whereby we can uh, express our will and interest in terms of developing a new Ottoman state. And we see within the Ottoman Empire the first elements of uh, uh, of modern political agitation that had never been used before. While there had been uh, printing presses in the Ottoman Empire before this point, they had never really been used to a political end as they had, for example, in Egypt with the Bulak press that we saw uh, two episodes ago. You, uh, Namik Kemal in particular, um, used the Ottoman press in order to uh, disseminate his views and he was a prolific writer. He wrote uh, both poetry and uh, prose works. Namek in particular, Namek Kamal in particular, um, tended to write about his understanding of the concept of Ottomanism and how he felt that there was something about the Muslim religion that had something to do with Ottoman character. There was something about the Turkish language that had something to do with Ottoman character. But at the same time, it was an identity and a, and a reality that non-Turkish Muslim Ottomans could also engage with. And it, had, and it had something to do with the institutions and history of the Ottoman experience. Namak uh, Kemal was uh, declared an enemy of the state by Amin Ali Pasha, and he relocated to Geneva, but he continued to uh, put uh, his work uh, out there by, uh, by using the presses in Europe and spreading that into Turkey uh, circuitously. Ibrahim Shinasi was a little bit more of a rationalist, but that said, he also uh, stressed this idea of democracy, and he does, and he also stressed the idea of a moral center of government that uh, Islam should be part of the Ottoman state, so just like Anamik Kamal said it should be, but it should be a part of the state in in terms of creating a moral compass. Right? There's the Islamic principle that. Uh, the state should enjoin good, right? It should promote good things and it should forbid evil things. And so this caretaker aspect of the state, um, this sort of moral guidance aspect of the state was something that Shinazi uh, strongly promoted. And together they and a number of other dissidents are collectively called the young Ottomans, despite the fact that aside from arguing that Islam has something to do with the Turkish identity, they were not Islamists. They were not interested in creating a theocratic state but they believed that there was something Muslim about the Ottoman Empire, and that should be represented in the politics of its government and its foundational values. They also even more strongly believed that the Tanzi match should be accomplished via uh, a, a parliamentary system as opposed to a top-down bureaucratic system. 
Now, of course, we have to remember that this is the same time that we have the massive circassian resettlement from the genocide that takes place in the Russian territories. And 700,000 to 800,000 circassians are resettled within the borders of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and these become effective shock troops uh, for the Sultan um, to use against the various uh, groups, especially the groups in, uh, in Rumelia, in modern Bulgaria, that are becoming less and less complacent with Ottoman authority. In, one, in, in a certain way, the Circassians, which themselves were a displaced minority, then became the ones who were part of the Ottoman state apparatus to displace other populations within the Ottoman Empire in a way of paying, uh, in a sa sort of sad way of paying the hurt forward. Um, of course, the Circassians had very little control over this, where they were settled, uh, what kind of uh, power that they had. Um, and uh, to the point that they were active in promoting this, uh, the agenda of the various sultans, it should be couched in the fact that they really had no other alternative. And, to, and the Ottoman Empire was really the only country that took them in after being expelled from Russia. So we then have uh, one of the massive developments that occurred uh, during the uh, 1870s, and that is the uh, and that is the creation of the Majlat al Ahkam al Adaliya, um, commonly known in English and in Turkish as the Majella. The Majella. Um, was a codification according to a Napoleonic style uh, legal codex of the Sharia, uh, specifically the Sharia of the Hanafi fiqh. Um, so what does that actually mean in terms of what Ahmed Javdid Pasha, the author, uh, among many authors, but he was the primary author, uh, in terms of what Ahmed Javdid Pasha was doing? Um, and why is this so revolutionary? The Islamic legal system for those who are more familiar with the Jewish legal system or um, any other uh, case law system, is organized as a set of questions about legal circumstances and the responses to those questions. For example, um, if uh, a man discovers that his wife has been adulterous, uh, what is the punishment for her? The punishment for her is XXY, right? Um, so, it's not listed in the order of like a, a template or an outline, uh, which is how legal codes are organized, right? And a legal code is set up in such a way that a judge simply goes to the index, looks at the section, pulls up the section and reads it. And this is the way that French law is organized today. This is the way that most countries actually organize their laws. The United States and, uh, and most countries influenced heavily by the United Kingdom are really the distinctive parties here and the countries that rule uh, almost dominantly by the Sharia um, are the exclusive um, groups that don't uh, really behave by this rule of having a codified system. And so in the French model, you begin to have the Magella, uh codified. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side, this is a French translation um, written by one of the last Fanariote uh, Dragomans, uh, Demetrius Nicolaides. And Demetrius Nicolaides, as you can tell by the name, uh, he's Greek, um, but he wrote this in French in order to disseminate it to France and to the international community to understand what the Ottoman civil code now was, this, uh, this canonization of Islamic law that would now apply to all the populations of the Ottoman Empire uh, because, of the, uh, because of the system that was now uh, in place. Uh, that would end the distinctions between the various religious minorities. And this sort of sees the phasing out of the Fanariotes as a power base um, within uh, Ottoman society in exchange for a new Sharia compliant bureaucracy. It's also an interesting change in terms of the, in terms of the dispensing of judgment, because now with this Magella, there is a standardized system by which the judges of the Ottoman Empire need to judge cases. And it means that the erratic decisions of the Sultan um, are now uh, removed from his power and put in the hands of the bureaucrats. And so you begin to see this tug of war 
of which the Magella is probably the clearest example, but there are other examples where the Council of Tanzimat, the Committee of Tanzimat, headed at this point by uh, Emin Ali Pasha um, until he dies in 1971, uh, sorry, 1871, um, is concentrating more power in the bureaucracy and the Sultan uh, is less and less able uh, to pull power back to the uh, authority, the absolute authority of the Sultan. We also see a, a period of immense discord within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in particular, we see what's called the three sultans in three years. Uh, Sultan Abdulaziz dies in 1876. He is replaced by Murad V, um, who rules for a few months, but is, uh, but is found to be relatively insane and uh, removed from power for the benefit of the Ottoman state. And Abdul Hamid II, who would eventually come to reign for nearly three decades, um, was uh, brought into power. But because of this, there was a lot of turmoil within the empire and the Grand Vizier Ahmed Shafiq Mithal Pasha um, was able to uh, impose upon Abdul Hamid II at the very beginning of his tenure, um, some requirements in order for him to replace Murad V. And one of them is that he was a supporter of the young Ottoman proposal of creating a parliament. And with the death of Emin Ali Pasha in 1871, Namik Kemal and a number of the other young Ottomans who'd been forced out of the empire came back in and became increasingly popular with their desire to create this kind of Ottoman state for all Ottomans. And they do create this parliament in 1876. It is inaugurated and it is inaugurated with the creation of the first Ottoman constitution, the Kanuni Osmani Esasi, or the basic Ottoman law. Uh, you can see a copy of it on the left-hand side in Ottoman Turkish. And the Kanune Osmani Asasi um, gave specific rights to the parliament in terms of how it could convene, what kinds of laws it could have, and uh, to what extent the Sultan had to listen to it or, or had the power uh, to um, close it. Now, to say that the elections in 1876 went poorly is an understatement. There were massive problems in terms of the vote. And we, and we see this in many nascent uh, democracies and quasi-democracies today. Um, one of the ones in particular that was most commonly uh, seen was that the ions or the nobles in the various provinces um, influenced people very strongly to vote for candidates that supported their agendas. And uh, we have instances of vote buying, we have instances of coercion, um, and these are not singular instances, but numerous across the Ottoman Empire, where the ions uh, have effectively uh, managed to control the voting process, and that resulted in a parliament that reflected many of the old aristocratic tendencies uh, within the Ottoman Empire, rather than an actual representation of the majority of either bourgeoisie or peasants within the empire. Another major issue is that the rule of law had never properly been established. Um, so you didn't have proper debating techniques. There, uh, there, there wasn't a key recognition of the right of a parliamentarian speakers uh, to speak. There wasn't any clear understanding of uh, how votes would be counted and tabulated, which made the whole affair rather raucous. Uh, you can see um, a picture of the Ottoman parliament in the center uh, in 1877. That was the second convocation. Um, and it was a little bit better then, but um, the picture sort of uh, doesn't show just how confused and uh, noisy the situation was. There was representation for Jews and Christians um, and, they, uh, and they elected their own religiously affiliated representatives. Um, the equality had not quite happened to the point where Jews and Christians were voting and being voted on as Ottoman citizens. They were being uh, bought, they were being voted on as members of their specific religious groups. Now, of the religious minorities, those who were not rabbinical Jews, Sunni Muslims, um, or uh, one of the recognized Christianities, those individuals did not have representation in the parliament. We're talking about, for example, the Druze, the Shiites, um, the 
the Karaitic Jews, the um, the Catholics. Um, all of these groups were not recognized as as religions under the uh, under the system of the millets uh, before, and so they did not have uh, representatives in parliament uh, for their religion. And compounding the problems facing this parliament was the fact that in 1875, just one year earlier, um, the Ottoman Empire had declared bankruptcy on all of the loans that it had been taking out to engage in all these modernization reforms. So that resolving that bankruptcy was the first uh, object of the parliament. And of course, choosing how to pay a bankruptcy is the one thing that you're sure is going to alienate every constituency because no constituency wants to pay the money for that. So with this backdrop of a new Ottoman parliament forming, we begin to see problems resurfacing in the Balkans. And we talked a little bit about this on the, um, on the Balkan nationalism side, but suffice it to say that these uh, revolts in 1875, 1876 um, were put down relatively easily. The Ottoman empire had the strength and power within its own borders to put down any resistance movement. Um, and the resistance movement of Montenegro, which was nominally independent. Um, but the problem was, is that after the Ottomans put down these revolts, they engaged in numerous massacres. You can see a painting in the upper left of the Batak mass massacre that was visited on the Bulgarians after their failed uprising in 1876, the, uh, which is the, called the April Uprising. And the word about these massacres and these uh, and these repudiations um, was intense, which and led to the Ottomans um, basically uh, being forced um, to uh, weather the international uh, spotlight for these abuses against uh, those populations. And with the defeats or near defeat of the Serbians and Bulgarians, the Russians decided that they would uh, they had enough political capital on their side to launch a war against the Ottomans uh, in reprisal for the way that they had been treating these revolutions. And so then we get to the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878, where the Russians intervene on the side of the Serbs and Bulgarians um, against the Ottoman forces. And the war can be divided into two fronts. There's the Balkan front and the Caucasian front, and we'll get to each of those. On the Balkan front, um, this is the side that is uh, more famous. Um, in particular, you have the Battle of Shipka Pass. Um, in the center of Bulgaria, there is a mountain range that separates the northern part of Bulgaria from the southern part of Bulgaria. And if I can draw it on the map, you can see it roughly around here. This is where, uh, that mountain, uh, the, those mountains run, and it makes it very difficult uh, to reinforce troop positions north of that line um, if you are coming from south of that line, which is exactly what the situation was in the Ottoman Empire. Now, in uh, there were a few passes that existed uh, to move armaments through, and one of them was Shipka Pass. Um, the Bulgarian forces that were there, along with Russians, but the Bulgarians were, were more numerous, decided to hold their position regardless of the Ottoman attack uh, on Shipka Pass in order to pass material through to the north. Um, and the Bulgarians fought with everything they had. You can see this painting commemorating the battle, um, and you can see the Bulgarians uh, were very disordered, throwing rocks, uh, whatever, uh, hitting people with the back of their guns because they'd run out of bullets, anything they could do to hold back the Ottomans. And surprisingly, they were actually successful and they maintained uh, uh, the ability to, um, to hold Shipka Pass. Uh, and this is uh, recorded to the Bul on the Bulgarian side as one of their great victories, one of their great moments in their nationalist struggle. One of the other things that we should point out about the Caucasian front is that the Navy of the Russians was back in, uh, in force in the Black Sea again. And this would sound surprising considering we learned in the Crimean War that the Russians were required to destroy their entire Black Sea fleet and were forbidden from creating one. 
The reason for this is that the Russian foreign minister, Alexander Gorchakov, um, was able to negotiate with Germany um, in order to pressure the other powers in order to permit the Russians to rebuild their Black Sea fleet in 1874. Uh, and so by this point, um, uh, the Russians managed to bombard um, Ottoman positions from the water. We also see the siege of Nicopolis. Uh, for those who have been following uh, this series uh, for a long time, you can probably remember back to uh, episode 17 or 18, uh, when uh, we talked about the crusade at Nicopolis in 1396, where Bayezid, uh, or Bayezid the Thunderbolt, Bayezid the First, held back um, uh, a crusading army led by King Sigismund of Hungary um, that tried to take the city at Nicopolis. So the fall of this city to Bulgarian uh, and Russian forces in 1877 was seen as a major cultural loss by the Ottoman Empire um, because it, it sort of heralded the end of Ottoman control in the Balkans altogether. And there's one particular story I want to tell, and that's the story of Osman Nuri Pasha. You can see him in the upper left-hand side. Osman Nuri Pasha is probably the most decorated uh, general in the entire history of the Ottoman Empire. And he was, uh, he was an incredible general uh, and tactician, and he was in charge of defending the Turkish military bastion at Plevna. The Russians and Bulgarians besieged his position, um, and he led several sorties um, fighting as best as he could. But when the Battle of Shipka Pass prevented uh, reinforcements from coming and uh, relieving his position, um, he was caught and, and was forced to surrender in his last sortie against the Russians when he had no material left. Um, he was treated honorably by the Russians and returned to Istanbul after the war where he was uh, uh, given the title of Field Marshal of the Empire. Um, but still to this day, there is the what's called the Plevna Marsha um, or the Plevna March, um, which is a Turkish um, song commemorating the loss of Plevna um, and um, how difficult it was uh, to surrender that uh, fortress to the Russians after fighting so valiantly in its defense. We then turn to the Caucasian Front and the Caucasian Front moves from territory that is currently um, on the border between Russia and uh, sorry, on the border between Georgia and Armenia on the Russian imperial side and Turkey um, on the Western side. The borders are not exact, but after the war, the territory controlled by the, Tur by the Russian empire digs deep into what is today Turkey. Um, and the major attack was centered on first the city of Dobayzit and then from there to Kars, um, uh, leading from a number of Georgian cities. And the and what's really uh, interesting to point out here is that you had large-scale Armenian participation in this war on the Russian side. But And to point this out, these are Armenians who lived in the territory of Russia. If you remember back one or few uh, episodes, we mentioned that in the territory of what is now modern Armenia, uh, you had the process of re armenification where the Russian government encouraged Armenian people to return to that territory that had been historically Armenian, but was only 20% Armenian um, at the time of 1826. And so by this point, you had large Armenian populations that were incredibly loyal to the Russian government in the Russian imperial side of the Armenian homeland. And so of the generals, um, that coordinated the attack. There was, there was one chief general and four subordinate generals. All four of the subordinate generals were Russian Armenians. Um, you can see one of those, that's uh, Hovanes Davili Lazarian. Um, Hova, um, I think his Russian name was uh, Ivan uh, Davidovich Lazarevich, um, right? Because of course the Russians change uh, all their surnames, but uh, Hovanes Davili Lazarian was his Armenian name. And he led a number of battles, especially around the city of Kars. Um, another ethnic group that's worth pointing out here are the Kurds. And we're going to talk more about the Kurds um, probably in May. Um, but what's really interesting here about the Kurds 
is that the Kurds had an had a degree of autonomy in the eastern parts of the Ottoman Empire and uh, where you get closer to the Iraqi border as well. And you had a number of Kurds um, who marshaled their forces to fight alongside the Ottoman soldiers, but you had families like uh, like that of Abdurrazik Badir Khan, who actually fought on the Russian side, uh, hoping for a Russian victory in Kars. Um, believing that the modernization attempts of the Ottoman Empire, all the Tenzimat reforms, would eventually lead to their disempowerment um, and lead to a federalization of their territories. And so they would rather be under the Russians where they could negotiate some sort of deal similar to how the Caucasian republics, in many respects, had a degree of autonomy in the Russian Empire. And of course, a discussion of the war of of Russian of Russo Turkish War of 1877 to 1878 would be incomplete without a discussion of the massive number of massacres that occurred during the war. Uh, those on the Muslim side are on the left hand side of the screen, those on the Christian side are on the right hand side of the screen. Um, in particular, uh, you can see the execution of the Bashi Bozuks. The Bashi Bozuks were sort of these um, bullies, is sort of a strong word for it. Um, uh, mil uh, irregular military units um, that generally attacked uh, the Bulgarian population, those who did not flee with the Ottoman army that retreated towards Istanbul um, were captured by the Bulgarians and hung. But it wasn't just Bashi Bozuks that were hung. We have estimates of hundreds of thousands of Turks who were forced to leave uh, their homes in, in what's today Bulgaria. Remember that Bulgaria had regions of Turkish majority settlement um, because of Rumelia, because of the Timari, uh, Timariot and all of these kinds of things that were based in what is today Bulgaria. You had hundreds of thousands of Turkish people living in Bulgaria and most of them had to leave. You can see the Turkish refugees from Tarnava um, forming a, a cavalcade there. Uh, those were the ones who escaped. Um, many others were not as lucky. You, uh, you also, when we see that the Turks are compelled to leave a settlement, almost always the Jews are compelled to leave with them. In many cases, the Jews were seen by the Bulgarians and the Russians to be complicit with the Ottoman Empire. And given that the Jews received better treatment under the Ottoman Empire than they could expect to receive from uh, the Christian Slavs, um, it's not unreasonable to think that they would have preferred an Ottoman victory. Uh, there's no evidence that they collaborated, though. On the right-hand side, we have massacres of Bulgarians. This is Starazakora, uh, which is probably the largest single massacre of Bulgarians uh, in the war. Uh, Two-thirds of the Bulgarians that were killed were in Starazakora or the area around it. It was one of the largest cities of Bulgaria, if not the largest in terms of population before the war. Um, 15,000 to... Uh, 15,000, it's estimated, Bulgarians were massacred. And you can see in the mausoleum, um, the heads of those victims uh, piled high. Uh, you can still uh, go to Starasagora and see that um, in Bulgaria to this day um, in, in commemoration for the martyrs. You also have Armenians from the areas that remained part of the Ottoman Empire after the war, um, fleeing into Georgia and what is now modern Armenia um, because of the Circassians who the Ottoman Empire sent uh, along with Kurds uh, to attack the Armenian population, the Armenian civilian populations um, that they considered to be in alliance with the Armenian military populations that were part and parcel of the Russian military. Despite the fact that there was no evidence that the Armenian civilian population was in any way coordinating, helping, or um, or providing cover to uh, the Russians. Now, one of the things that I didn't cover on the Caucasian front, and if you see it uh, very closely, the Russians pursued the Ottomans all the way to San Stefano, which is just outside of Constantinople. And you can see those red arrows moving slowly southward uh, towards Constantinople. By the time the Ottoman Empire sued for peace because of how close the Russians were to attacking uh, Istanbul, um, it meant that the Russians would uh, be able to pretty much dictate any terms that they wanted to the Ottomans. And so the terms that they dictated uh, included the following. Uh, 
they would take all of the territory that they had conquered in the Caucasus. You can see the Caucasus uh, expansion uh, on the right side of the screen, um, including uh, the what's now the Ajar region of Georgia and the Kars region of Turkey. They would also take um, a significant amount of territory for Bulgaria, for Bulgaria, which includes both the modern states of Bulgaria and Macedonia, along with some territories that belong to modern day Greece and modern day Turkey. Um, and some of those territories, including, for example, the city of Bidin, um, are part of modern day um, Serbia. Now, this um, massive Bulgaria was something that the great powers were not in favor of. Um, and they would make uh, other change. They would make changes to this agreement at St. At St. Stefano. But uh, before we leave this page, there were two other things that I wanted to point out. The first is that with the independence of Bulgaria, the, inc the independence of Serbia that would be guaranteed, the independence of Greece, the populations of Albania realized that without organization, their territories would become subsumed eventually by these independent Christian states. And the Albanians were a mix of uh, Sunni, Bektashi, Catholic, and Orthodox populations, all united by their Albanianness, uh, but still generally divided by clans uh, and organization. And so they had to come together as a league of Prizren. And the League of Prizren existed in four different vilayats of the Ottoman Empire, and you can see them on the left-hand side. And this is really the first time that the Albanians begin to organize under anything close to a nationalistic banner. Um, and Albanian nationalism doesn't really develop until the 20th century. But this is the thing that pushes it. Because as you can see, uh, the cities of Ohrid um, and uh, Kutche, um are territories that are very close, if not within uh, Albanian majority territory. And the other piece is that in order for the Ottoman Empire to get the great powers to assist them in rewriting the Treaty of San Stefano, um, the Ottoman Empire had to make a concession. And so that concession was to Britain uh, to give them control of the island of Cyprus in 1878. And as, uh, as recompense for this, uh, recompense for this, the British uh, helped negotiate uh, with uh, Otto von Bismarck of Germany, a more stable solution, uh, which required a much smaller Bulgaria. You can see Bulgaria is divided between a North and a Southern region. The Southern region is Eastern Rumelia. And Eastern Rumelia uh, was not independent. It was part of uh, the Ottoman Empire. It would eventually, uh, as a, uh, as a vassal state, um, it would eventually uh, become independent and become part of Bulgaria, but that would take a few years. The territory of Romania was also changed. The territory of Serbia was expanded. Um, and uh, so was some of the territory of uh, Montenegro. Uh, you can see it in blue. You can see it in that sort of bluish purple color. And the Ottoman Empire uh, got some of its lands back. You can see the outline of uh, Greater Bulgaria um, that was recognized by St. Stefano in sort of the brown uh, on this map and how much territory the Bulgarians actually lost under the Congress of Berlin of 1878. But 1878 is also the closing chapter on this Tanzimat and Ottomanism discussion because Sultan Abdul Hamid II uses the fact that there is chaos throughout the Ottoman Empire, there are rebellions throughout the country, people are unhappy with the war effort, the budget can't be resolved, all these major issues. He decides to permanently uh, close the parliament and begin to establish his own absolute power bureaucracy at Yildiz Palace um, starting in 1880. Uh, start, sorry, starting in 1880, it's in Yildiz Palace. But prior to that, in 1878, he ends the parliament and begins an authoritarian rule that will stretch until the Young Turk Revolution in 1908. And we're going to cover all of that stuff eventually. Um, but that sort of closes uh, the door on this chapter of Ottoman history. Um, and no, and while Abdul Hamid II was forward thinking, he would not entertain um, bureaucrats or parliamentarians uh, telling him what to do and constraining his 
uh, political aspirations. So any questions on the Ottomans? Um, next week, we are going to do um, the uh, 19th century uh, in the Maghreb region. So that includes Morocco, uh, sort of following up on this lecture, everything that happened after Sidi Mohammed, uh, as well as what happened in Algeria uh, and Tunisia. We will then be taking a break of three weeks and reconvening in May uh, to discuss the Persians. We also have our uh, European Union series, which will be on the 20th of April, I, I believe, whatever that Sunday is, where we'll cover more issues related to European Union security. Uh, we have um, our Roman series. I remember reading some time ago that the Ottomans, I think in the 19th century, or maybe even earlier, were, got on the idea of factories. They, they saw that the, you know the Europeans were inventing factories, and that the the, the 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 Pasha said, "Go make factories," and they didn't know what to do so much. Does that does that ring a bell with you? I mean, we talked about the industrialization in the Ottoman Empire during the Tanzimat period. Um, in in many cases, what ended up happening is you had European advisors who assisted with the creation of modern. Uh, factories and developments, especially uh, with the minority communities. Uh, the Greeks were known for, uh, the Greeks and Armenians especially, were known for uh, uh, munitions manufacture. Um, in Egypt, you had a much more thorough modernization, right, we talked about in the 19th century, than anything we saw in the Ottoman Empire in terms of its speed and its organization. The problem, of course, is that the Egyptians lost power um, because of the massive debts that they took out uh, from the great powers. And we, and we covered that about two weeks ago. But in Morocco, the period that we're covering is in this up to the 1700s. So the industrialization that hit Europe hasn't even hit Europe yet. Europe is more advanced than Morocco, certainly, uh, in terms of the creation of weapons and munitions. But Morocco is relatively on par with Europe in terms of city organization, sanitation, um, medicine, these kinds of developments. The real break occurs in the 19th century. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question of uh, why did Moroccans not expand overseas? Uh, uh, I covered why the Ottomans didn't expand overseas um, to a greater extent um, in, I think, lecture 24, lecture 25. But really, the borders of the Ottoman Empire didn't allow for that. The Moroccans resisted the Ottomans uh, getting access to the Atlantic. The Ottomans um, did expand over the Indian Ocean. They made strong relations with uh, Indian states like, uh, like, uh, like Gwalior, I think. Um, sorry, the name, the name escapes me. Um, but they even set up uh, what can be called a colony in Aceh, which is modern day Indonesia. Um, there, as I said, they had alliances with a number of Indian states. Their easiest access to the ocean was the Indian Ocean, um, but they didn't have access to the Atlantic. And so that made it very difficult for them to colonize. Additionally, it wasn't clear that the new world would be in any way profitable for the Ottoman Empire. The reason that Europeans were interested in it was the promise of gold, but they didn't know where it was. And, there, uh, and so that, that, that sort of forestalled that option until the Europeans had already found all the gold there was by destroying the two empires that had amassed it. Then the other problem is that the European states have a mercantilist economic system which would reward uh, individuals going and making businesses in the new world and exporting those goods to Europe. There was no similar system in the Ottoman Empire. So the revenue generation uh, model of the Ottoman Empire from the Timars at that point in the in the 1500s and 1600s, um, and from agriculture and peasantry, simply it doesn't it doesn't create a model that supports colonization in any serious sense, um, like the Europeans did. So that's that, those are the reasons why the Ottomans really didn't expand uh, overseas. All right. If there's nothing further, I think. Uh, we should call it a night. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and uh, I'll see you next week, then.